Hey, Gary, how you doing? I'm doing fine, David. So anyway, you remember the last or the previous video on negative resistance, and I was talking about negative resistance devices like the tunnel diode and the gun diode. And remember those? Absolutely. Yep. Yes. And I'm trying to put it in historical context. Anyway, um, what I wanted to do here was I wanted to show you something about okay. how you can apply negative resistance to what you might call everyday oscillators. But mm. like our old friend, the Colpitts oscillator, which you remember, mm -hmm. remember back when we were both into amateur radio in our younger oh. years and remember they'd show us in the, in the manuals to study for the license, show you a diagram of a Hartley oscillator or a Colpitts oscillator. And I don't know about yeah. you, but I would focus on those and I try to remember all the details. <laughs> yes, we all did. <laughs> because remember, sometimes on the license exams, they'd put up a schematic diagram and they'd say, yeah, what is identify this? Identify it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't really understand how those things worked, but, you know, I oh, remember well. the diagrams. Well, yeah. let me bring up uh, what I call here going negative part two. And let me start the slideshow. And okay. Slideshow, come on, Microsoft. Slideshow from the beginning. Here we go. <sighs> um, sometime this week would be good. Come on, Microsoft. Yeah, it looks like our connection may be a little bit slow today. Well, that shouldn't be it. It should be, I should see, oh, resume slideshow. Why? Okay, whatever. So, <laughs> there we go. Application of negative resistance to oscillator circuits. You remember last time I was showing you that if you take a, an LRC circuit, inductance, resistance, capacitance, and you put some energy in it and then let it go, like taking a charge yeah. capacitor and connecting it to the remainder of the network, you get this one possible mode of the transient response is this decaying sinusoid yes. like this. Okay. Yes. And if you, the resistance isn't open, so it's just a pure LR circuit, then you get a constant amplitude sinusoid. Uh -huh. But if you could somehow put a negative resistor on that network, you'd get this exponentially diverging sinusoid. Okay, yeah, I remember. I that, remember. Right? And uh -huh. they exploit this with some rather exotic oscillator circuits using devices like tunnel diodes or gun diodes where you put use a DC power supply to bias the device into its negative resistance region and add to it a resonance circuit, and it makes an oscillator. It just in and of itself makes an oscillator. And the oscillation will grow naturally until the voltage excursions across the diode start to take it out of its negative resistance region, and then it becomes a self-limiting process. Uh -huh. Okay. Anyway, but, you know, this sounds exotic, but if you look at it, ordinary sinusoidal oscillators, like the ones we studied in our, in our license exam days, you can analyze them with negative resistance. Most sinusoidal oscillators we run into aren't built with devices like tunnel diodes or gun diodes, but everyday oscillators, like the ones we're familiar with, depend upon negative mm -hmm. resistance but they don't use negative resistance elements. Okay. They have active circuits that synthesize negative resistance, make them behave as right. if they were negative resistors. It's very right. clever. Okay. <laughs> so you recognize this one, right? Oh, yes. And well, of course, the, the title gives it away at the top. This is a, <laughs> this is a Colpitts oscillator, and it has a Grounded base or common base connected bipolar transistor. Of course, when we were started studying these, that was a grounded grid tube. Mm -hmm. Okay. And 
and you have a capacitive voltage divider that's the feedback network and you have an inductor the inductor forms a resonance circuit with the capacitive feedback network and here's a load resistance and we have a dc blocking capacitor so that the dc collector voltage does not reach the load is not connected to the dc dc collector the load doesn't upset the DC operating point. Mm -hmm. That's what I should have said. <laughs> now okay. I did say it. Okay. And anyway, and this thing, this is a simulation circuit using uh, it was a simulation software called Multisim. And when you're simulating an oscillator circuit, you need to ensure self-starting, you need a little kickstart pulse. On, when you turn the power on to a real oscillator, there's always enough of a transient to kick it off and get it going, but not necessarily in a in a numerical simulation. So I, I just added a small right. pulse here that just, it's like kicking the Kickstarter on your motorcycle. Exactly. Get, get yeah. it started. So that's why I call it a Kickstart pulse source. And with a re load resistor of 680 ohms, this is what the simulation produces. And you see initially, we have an output voltage that looks like it's got an exponentially growing envelope. And so it looks like an LRC circuit with a negative resistance. Now then, though, of course, we see the amplitude stabilize, and there's an explanation for that though, too briefly, but... Anyway, I honed in on part of the waveform. This is, and it's 972 kilohertz with the components in the simulation. And if you look at the waveform, you can tell it's not quite a sinusoid. It's a little distorted. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. bad, but it's not real great. So anyway, the usual way that we teach electrical engineers to analyze oscillators to see if they're going to work is to apply the so-called Barkhausen criterion. You may have encountered this before. Does that name ring a bell, Barkhausen? Um, I have heard the term. I uh, do not fully understand exactly what uh, um, what it brings to the circuit. Well, I well, we teach the Barkhausen criterion for oscillation and that simply is that if you break the feedback loop and mm -hmm. you inject a signal into one side of the broken loop and look at the response at the other side, if the signal that's coming back is in phase with and at least as big as the original test signal, then if you take the test source out and close the loop, it'll be a self-sustaining oscillator. There's okay. enough coming back to keep feeding yeah. Um, you know, it's like your, the, your internal combustion engine is producing enough power, not only to, to, um, pr drive the drivetrain of your automobile, but it's also providing the power it needs to keep itself running. Uh -huh. You know, some okay. of its energy has to come back to keep the engine going. Right. Okay. All right. So. This is the usual thing, and the first thing you do with a book to test the Barkhausen criterion is you make a, an AC model of the circuit, and by that, we short-circuit uh, DC power supplies, and this arrow is supposed to be pointing here because there was a DC power supply connected to R1, but now we set it to zero. We make an AC or small signal model of the transistor, and we short-circuit the... Uh, DC blocking capacitor. And then we break the feedback loop. You see the connection here okay. between the capacitive feedback network voltage divider and the emitter has been broken. And then yeah. what I did here is I added this resistor to the feedback loop because it mimics the resistance that the feedback loop is looking into when it's connected because this is the parallel combination of the input resistance of the transistor and this resistor R1. Okay. So that's just so that the loading on the loop is unchanged when it's broken. Mm -hmm. And then we put a test source on it. And if we can find one frequency at which 
the voltage here that appears at the broken loop is in phase with the test voltage and at least as large. Then if I take the test source up and close the feedback loop, it will oscillate at that frequency. Okay. Okay. That's what we usually do. But so it's not always that easy to figure out how to break feedback loop. Uh -huh. But show you how you can use negative resistance to figure out when this thing will oscillate. Okay. But first of all, you've heard the term admittance, right? Yes. Okay. Hmm. But just in case somebody watches this who hasn't, you know what impedance is. And in a uh -huh. series circuit, you've got the same current running through all the circuit elements and the voltage across them is just the sum of the voltages across each element. Right. Okay. And we define any impedance, it's concept that comes out of the phasor transform. So it only applies to sinusoidal steady state AC analysis. But anyway, it's the relationship of voltage to current and we represent it as R plus Jx, where R is the resistance and X is the reactance. Mm -hmm. And the J indicates that there's a 90 degree phase shift between the voltage and the current in the reactance. Mm -hmm. And if you have a positive value of X, it means the voltage is leading the current by 90 degrees, which means right. that it's an inductor. And if it's negative, it's lagging by 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what I'm going to be talking about is admittance in this session and admittance is the relationship of current to voltage in a parallel circuit so all of the elements have the same voltage across them and the total current is the sum of the currents flowing in each of the parallel branches and the components of admittance are conductance and b is susceptance and that's a word you don't hear much yeah yeah susceptance but anyway a positive value of B means that the current's leading the voltage by 90 degrees, which means that the susceptance is a capacitive susceptance. Mm -hmm. And if it's a negative value, it's lagging by 90 degrees. That is, the mm -hmm. current's lagging the voltage by 90 degrees, so we have an inductor. Okay. Okay, so keep that in mind. So go back to the Colpitz oscillator. We're going to take off the kickstart pulse. For, we're looking for the negative resistance here. That's going to be an AC analysis, so we don't need the transient kickstart pulse. Uh -huh. Okay. And we short circuit the DC voltage sources. We're going to, for the time being, I'm going to remove the load resistance in the inductor. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the admittance right here at this node. You okay. see, that node is connected in parallel with the inductor and the load resistor. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to see, electrically speaking, what does all of this stuff over here on the left side look like? Okay. okay. And I'm going to replace the bipolar transistor with a small signal model. I have to show a little detail of that. I'm going to replace the transistor with... This is the so-called T model, because if you rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise, it kind of sh resembles the shape of the letter T. Okay. If you squint and just look at it just right, you can see it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. the transconductance of this transistor, that's the ratio of a change in the... Uh, um, base emitter voltage, it's a ratio of the change in collector current to a change in base emitter voltage that produced it. And the ratio between the two is the so-called transconductance. And it's so many milliampers per volt, you know, a, a change of so many millivolts between the base emitter produces a change of so many microamps or milliamps in the collector. And you can find it by taking the DC collector current and dividing by this quantity called the thermal voltage. I'll get to that in a second. And the base emitter resistance that appears in this linearized model is the transfer current transfer ratio divided by the transconductance. Let me explain. 
Um, when I did a DC simulation to find the operating point of that transistor, the collector yeah. current was 645 microamps and the emitter current was 650.5. And that gives an alpha, which is the ratio of collector current to emitter current of 0.992. Yeah. And okay. knowing the collector current and knowing the emitter current and knowing the thermal voltage, which the thermal voltage is 25.9 millivolts at 300 Kelvin, and it's directly proportional to absolute temperature. That gave a transconductance of 24.9 millisiemens or milliampers per volt. Okay. And RO is the output resistance of the transistor. And usually that's sufficiently large that for most analyses, we can ignore it. And it makes our life easier mm -hmm. to ignore it. So I'm gonna ignore mm -hmm. it. Okay. 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 And with the values that this, with the operating point of this transistor, the transconductance is 24.9 millisiemens, and the small signal input resistance was 39.8 ohms. Pretty low, but that's typical of a common base connected transistor. So here's the simulation model. And this RE here is there was a resistor R1 in the original circuit that was part of the bias network, which winds up in parallel with the base emitter small signal resistance. But you can see it went from 39.8 ohms due to the transistor alone to 39.7 when I included R1. So it's hardly worth fooling with, but yeah. Okay. Anyway, and I put a test source here on the output. And we're going to look at the emittance looking into this network. And at one megahertz, oh uh, yeah, here's the test voltage source. At one megahertz, the conductance was minus 1.805 plus J 5.044 millisiemens. You see that? It's showing yeah. a negative resistance. Right. It's, there's no negative resistance element here, but it's acting like mm -hmm. this. Okay, so this is yeah. cool. So, <laughs> okay, so if I resolve those into an equivalent resistance and capacitance in parallel, it looks like a capacitor of 804 picofarad in parallel with minus 554 ohms. Okay. Okay, so now sure. if I put an inductor of 31.5 microhenries on that, then I have an LRC network that has an undamped natural frequency of one megahertz and a negative conductance, which means that the if I put some energy in it, it will start to diverge. The amplitude will grow exponentially. Okay. Okay. Now, if I parallel that network, the LRC with the negative resistor, if I put a load resistor on it now, and if I put a 554 ohm load resistor on it, the conductance between the two, the negative resistor and the positive resistor, their conductances in parallel will sum to zero, meaning an open circuit. So for a load resistor of 554 ohms, we should have the conditions for a self-sustaining oscillator with constant amplitude. Mm -hmm. But if I have less than 554 ohms load resistance, the overall conductance goes positive, and then I should have a exponentially decaying transient response. Mm -hmm. It won't oscillate. So here's what happened when I did the simulation with 510 <laughs> ohms, the output voltage. Okay. This is a this is from the kickstart source. But you yeah. see the exponentially decaying. Mm -hmm. So the criterion for when do we see negative conductance in this circuit predicted that with the load resistance of 554 ohms is just on the edge of being able to oscillate. And that's mm -hmm. what the simulation seems to be confirming. So okay. we look for the negative resistance. Tell us where yeah. I, I, Now, okay. I thought that was cool. Now, just for grins, and anybody who wants to can stop here and look at these formulas if they want to. I worked out the conductance of the cold pits oscillator, the transistor and the feedback network. And I worked out the susceptance. I did the math, so you don't have to. 
But one thing I'll point out here, in this circuit, one over RE and GM are very close to each other. So this term is usually close to zero. So what's left is you see a negative term produces a right. negative conductance. And similarly, this term is very inconsequential in the susceptance. Mm -hmm. And when you, if, if the one over RE term is relatively small compared to this one, then the susceptance becomes that of two capacitors in series. So the formula, simple formula to figure out what frequency the thing will oscillate. Yeah. Anyway, but okay. there's that negative resistance again. Mm -hmm. Found yeah. it. And that we can use that as a criterion to determine when the Colpitz works. Okay. It's so oscillate. So here. Interesting. <laughs> okay. So why did it reach a limiting amplitude? We had negative resistance to begin with, with 680 ohms, but then the amplitude limited. Obviously, no oscillation is going to continue increasing exponentially in amplitude forever. forever. Uh -uh. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, what 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 limits it? Any? I'm putting you on the spot, aren't I? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um... I'm thinking, okay, starting with a, 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 a negative resistance, um, would it be the actual change? And when you when you reach the uh, a resistance value that stabilizes, I could be way off here. No, you're <laughs> not actually. What what what's happening is as the signal amplitude gets bigger, the gain of the transistor begins dropping off. That is for a larger base emitter voltage change mm -hmm. as that, that gets bigger, it gets less effective at producing a change in the base or in the collector current. Effectively, the transconductance mm -hmm. drops as the signal amplitude gets larger. There's only a limited range of voltages where you can treat the relationship of collector current to base emitter voltages linear you start to increase the signal level beyond that point and you see that for a given increment in base emitter voltage you get a smaller progressively smaller increments of collector current so the gain is dropping as the amplitude mm. builds yeah. and eventually it drops the gain of the transistor drops to just what's necessary to keep the oscillation constant so mm -hmm. it's it's okay. a passive form of limiting the amplitude. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have a lot of hand waving here. Now, you remember the Weinbridge oscillator? Mm -hmm. This is a circuit yes. that doesn't have any inductors. Mm -hmm. Okay. No nope. physical inductors. <laughs> but you have a voltage amplifier, and you have a series RC network and a parallel RC network. And typically, the same capacitor value is used in both places and the same resistor value in both places, but that's mm -hmm. not mandatory. And if I use okay. the Barkhausen criterion, breaking the feedback loop, this one is actually easy to see where to break the feedback loop and test it. Um, some oscillator circuits are not easy to do that. But this mm -hmm. one is, if we open it and we insert a test voltage, and the Barkhausen criterion says that if the voltage here fed back at the broken loop is equal to that of the test voltage, then we have mm -hmm. conditions for oscillation. And I did a simulation of the Weinbridge oscillator with, um, let's see. Yes, uh, these component values you see here, I did have the component values. And at one kilohertz, the loop gain the magnitude of the gain goes through zero decibels or unity at one kilohertz, right where the phase goes through one, through zero degrees. So <laughs> if we take the, if we close the loop, take the test source out and close the loop, this thing should oscillate at one kilohertz. Okay. Okay. But <clears throat> let's see if we can apply negative resistance. <clears throat> 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take capacitor C2 out and we're going to find the admittance of the remainder of the network on the right side of this dashed line. Okay. We're going to resolve it into a parallel resistance and a parallel inductance, it turns out. The admittance, again, I did the math so you don't have to. A here is the voltage gain of the um is the voltage gain of the voltage amplifier and um an interesting thing if you make the resistors and the two resistors the same and the two capacitors the same and if let them be value c and if you let um omega angular frequency of operation be one over RC. And if you make the gain three, magic number of three, then this term goes to zero. The conductance goes to zero. So you get right. the resistance disappears. And if the gain exceeds three, the conductance actually goes negative. Okay. Interesting. So... Hmm. I, yeah, here's here's the conductance. That's one over the equivalent resistance. And here's the susceptance, which is minus one over omega L. Okay, I did some calculations at one kilohertz. And for a voltage gain of 2.8, the equivalent resistance of this network is 159K positive. And it looks, the synthetic inductance looks like 2.82 Henry's. At a gain of three, I'm getting minus 56 mega ohms. That's because omega, the, the natural frequency, I, one over RC is not exactly two pi times one kilohertz because uh -huh. I rounded off this resistor value. Anyway, so it's the resistance is close to being infinite. It's very large. Mm -hmm. And we've got 2.53 Henry's. And if I go up to 3.2, it's a negative resistance. Our mm -hmm. equivalent is negative. So at three, it should be a self-sustaining oscillator if we put if we put up oh, okay, we got 10 minutes. Um <laughs> with a gain of three, that's the magic number for making the original circuit a self-sustaining oscillator. Okay. okay. Now, problem is, how do you make it? I mean, it's balanced on the knife edge. You get 2.999 and it slowly collapses. You get 3.001 and it slowly increases. Mm -hmm. So how do you stabilize it? Well, typically in the Weenbridge, we use an op amp with as the, as the voltage amplifier and it has a gain of one plus the ratio of these two resistors. So if you make this resistor twice as large as this one, you have a non-inverting amplifier with a gain of three. Mm -hmm. And the way we do okay. this in practice, I mean, you're still, you know, you get tolerances just a little off and it either works or it doesn't, or it runs <laughs> yeah. away. So what we do to force this one to sell, to limit, this is clever. We add a second branch in parallel with, with R4, if the diodes are open circuits, they're not conducting, then we have a gain of this amplifier of 3.2, but the voltage gain is 2.8 if the diodes were replaced with short circuits, which would put R5 in parallel with R4. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between diodes open and diodes fully conducting, there is a magic equivalent resistance of the diodes it gives us just the gain we need that's mm -hmm. clever the so, sweet spot yes yes, yes. <laughs> with the diodes not conducting the voltage gain is enough that it's a negative we have a negative resistance condition and it the amplitude of the oscillation diverges exponentially but as the amplitude builds the diodes start to conduct it reduces the gain and stabilizes the output voltage very okay. clever okay okay and here we have a little kickstart source to make the, the simulate the numerical simulation run. And voila, 
that's the simulation of it. And that's putting out a beautiful one kilohertz sine wave. Yep. And you know, okay. Hewlett Packard's very first product was a Wien bridge oscillator. I actually mm -hmm. found their patent and figured out how the circuit worked. It was very clever. Okay. Nin 1939. <laughs> The, wow. uh, the HP1A or whatever model number was. Uh -huh. And it was a Weinbridge <laughs> oscillator. But you see, <laughs> we can tell when the Weinbridge is going to oscillate by applying negative resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's not an inductor in sight and there's not a negative resistance element in sight, but we've synthesized both of them and we're good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we're visiting the electronic past with us. And well, I think it was very informative, Mr. Beams. Well, I hope so. I mean, it was an interesting topic to me, and um, you don't often hear of negative resistance being talked about in electronics classes. This, this is true, yeah. yeah. But it's it's actually what's behind all those oscillator circuits that we learned about mm -hmm. as kids. Anyway, mm -hmm. my friend, we look forward mm -hmm. to the next time. Okay. Well, thank you for the information and the presentation, which was excellent. Thank you much. We'll see you later, Gary. Bye-bye. Okay.